Okay. So, welcome everyone. Good morning. Okay. Thank you. Too nice of you. So, I'm not a millennial. Can you guess it? And uh, anyway, though I'm not a millennial, this morning I had a couple of minutes of shock because I forgot the phone in my, in my room. And um, the thing that made me crazy for, for a few minutes was just that I couldn't take pictures. Not, not, not just instant messaging, but just the, ability, the inability of taking pictures and you know, memories of the past. Well, yeah, uh, phones and smartphones and these things uh, changed our life. And uh, I, I'm curious, and what, what shocks me about socials and being a millennial is uh, that everything that is written on the internet seems to be through to, this, to the new generation, in much the same way to my generation, my parents, my grandparents' generation, what, whatever was being said on TV was the absolute truth. What is the source of truth? And yesterday I took a picture on the live during a talk from uh, Kiprian Hikichi about quantum computing. He put on the screen at some point uh, a complex uh, uh, quantum mechanics uh, uh, um, formula. So I took a picture and then I tweeted that saying something like, uh, okay, to cut a long story short, Will ever this uh, fucking quantum computers uh, some way will make my SQL queries run much faster than today? And, and, and someone apparently took it seriously because they replied with a detailed explanation why <laughs> quantum computers won't make my SQL queries run faster. Oh, that's surprising. So, from CRUD, and everyone here, I guess, knows what CRUD is, create, read, update, and delete, to even sourcing. Well, no, this is the wrong talk. Oh, shit. This is the right one. From CRUD to blockchain, adding history to the future. History to the future. Sounds like an oxymoron. Oh, anyway, uh, be, be getting back to serious mode. Uh, it's not completely a joke. If uh, okay, if I yeah, if I switch the two slides, changing even sourcing to blockchain, the, there is uh, something in common, even though we are talking about completely different things. But the overlapping, the highest level of abstraction between even sourcing and blockchain is not completely empty. It's not empty. In both cases, we are talking about a ledger. We are talking about something that keeps track of every single minimal thing that makes sense to track in a given business domain. This is exactly the point in common between even sourcing and blockchain to the point that whenever I hear non-lawyers, non-journalists, non-media people talking about blockchain, I wonder if they really mean a world, they really dream of a software world, a business world in which every single minimal action is automatically tracked. And then the views from those events adapted to scenarios are extracted. Uh, the most illustrious, simple to understand, but extremely straight to the point example of even sourcing is uh, your bank account. When you interact most of the time with your bank account, the only thing you want to know is how much money you have left on your bank account, the balance. That's all you want. And that's a number. But that number could be stored in some sort of bank database in a in relational way. Imagine a table all your demographics details, and then the number, bank account number. Or it could be the result, the computed result, of a calculation that starts from the very beginning of the list of transactions you made through your bank account, the day you opened it to date. There was a, an initial balance, zero or whatever, 
and then a list of operations, at the end of which the current balance results. So you, you, you see the difference. The list of events, a view out of those events. But you can also get different types of numbers out of your bank account. You can have, for example, the list of withdrawals. It's another number. Or it's another sublist. So on top of the same static, immutable list of events in stored in some sort of conceptual ledger, out of that you take out whatever different views you need in a given business scenario. This is the essence of event sourcing. Now, the funny story that uh, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, present today is manual interaction starts here. This is a tweet of two years, over two years ago, two years and a half ago. And uh, you may notice that from the emphasis uh, that artificial intelligence two years and a half ago was not that the crazy popular thing it is today. And uh, the term big data was still used as if it were a real buzzword. Anyway, uh, far before deep learning, blah, 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 we need software architecture able to collect big data. So this is exactly what event sourcing delivers. So the, if we want to really be serious in a big data, and you know, I, I'm, I'm really talking about real big data. So big data that comes out of real business in not necessarily super big utility scale scenarios. Also in, for every company, for everyone. We should probably try to think about, rethink about the storage layer of our applications so that we can automatically, natively, as it goes, keep track of business-relevant events. Uh, what is a business-relevant event? This is a good point, and this is precisely the point of this talk. Is it crude, or is it something else? Is it crude, or is it domain model? That's the point. Because um, in a few minutes, I will uh, show what SQL Server can do out of the box for you, for tracking events. The point is, how are we in our specific application good with what SQL Server does natively out of the box? Or do we need to build some more abstraction and uh, keep track of non-crude events but domain model related events? If you want to do the second thing, we need to go beyond crude and we need to get into the dazzling world of blockchain, oh, I'm sorry, dazzling new world of event sourcing. I guess that nobody here today is really collecting big data automatically, natively out of the application running. So most of the time, for what is my experience, companies have a, have a data lake in which they throw everything that they can collect around the company. But most of the time, this process is uh, something that is periodically done. So you periodically collect that from the company and then poof, throw it into the data lake. Then when you have an idea of what to do with the, with the part of those data, you just go there, build a data warehouse, and then once you have info structured, you uh, start uh, making some, some business. So the point is, how do we want to go about getting big uh, uh, data? Every time we update a record on a plain or national database, we automatically forget about the previous state he had. It's a snapshot versus something else. And you know, data is the most valuable asset. Um, this is, it's so obvious, this point that I, I really invite you once more to think about uh, if in your business application, in your business scenario, keeping track of everything natively in an apparently costless way, it happens because it happens in a natural way, makes sense. Now, how to 
get into this more concretely. There are basically three options. We can uh, change the way in which we do crude today. Maybe uh, this essentially means uh, that for every repository we likely have in our multi-layer applications, uh, we just uh, replace every update operation with uh, a transaction that does the update plus logs what has happened to some additional history table so that you have uh, the same information written in two places and you don't lose anything. You keep track of the current state of your records as it happens normally, but you also have a log history table in which you can go and using the same ID of the record or whatever key makes that record uniquely identifiable, you can get the list of changes business, relevant for your business it went through in the entire life of the application. This is about rewriting CRUD. Or we can replace CRUD using an even sourcing approach. Or we can evolve CRUD using what? Using a one of the newer versions of SQL Server, this feature was introduced way back in 2016, so it's nothing you know, of yesterday or tomorrow, and evolved CRUD in a way that is precisely the, the point of my demos today, uh, gives a smarter CRUD in which the, some events are tracked automatically natively uh, by the infrastructure. CRUD today. It's not exactly a comfortable position. Anyway, uh, we have a create, read, update, and delete operations that we do on entities. Those entities are, what, what, what entities really mean in this context? If we're doing crude, so if we're uh, implementing, if you if you, are, if you are viewing our storage infra infrastructure layer in terms of create, read, update, and delete operations on entities, likely those entities are one-to-one -one with the tables we have in our relational model. And then uh, when we want to raise the abstraction level, what we do is uh, we add aggregates, we combine entities into aggregates, and this is exactly the key message we receive from uh, methodologies like domain-driven design. But an aggregate is uh, essentially a way of combining things together. It's an artificial way to mediate between a relational model and an object oriented model. And in fact, ORRM, Entity Framework, Hibernate and Hibernate, those products are exactly ORRM, Object Relational Mappers. Now, let's uh, expand more, a little bit more on the C, R, U, and D. C is for create, and the logic for creation. So when we create in a business application, a new entity. Why we do that is subject to the application logic. It's subject to the processes that we are orchestrating through the user interface in first place, because it's where the user interacts. And then the user at some point fills out, provides, fills in some data, and then pushes a button or something. And that triggers a process in which Likely, we have uh, the need to create elements, but uh, instances of, uh, of entities. And uh, the entities, the way which we create those entities, the parameters we pass to those entities, constructors, or factories, that depends on the application logic. Differently, U and D, update and delete, those are likely more depending on the domain logic. Updates depend on are subject to business rules. Deletions, whether they are soft or 
hard, they likely depend on business rules. So they are subject to the business logic for the specific domain and reads instead. Those things are likely influenced by what kind of data, what kind of shape data needs to have when we present it to users. So it is highly influenced by the presentation logic. Good. So now, in, uh, in SQL Server, in relational databases, we have uh, specific instructions, SQL-based instructions, for any of those things. And when we do, for example, a delete, or when we do an update, it's an overwrite. We change the value of a column, we delete an entire record. So the problem of introducing software forms of updates and deletes is a problem that, you know, pop it up way back. It's not a problem of today. In, in fact, ANSI SQL 2011, that standard, introduced features, suggestions, dictated the way in which databases, relational, the relational database management systems had to deal with uh, historical data management. It's not something of yesterday or even today. It's 2011. And uh, for uh, soft updates and soft deletes, the goal, the purpose, the, 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 the direction is a soft update is a standard update operation that in some way preserves the old state. In some way means it's up to you, essentially. A soft delete is an update that just marks the state of the record has deleted. So in the end, a soft delete is easily and commonly implemented, adding an extra column to all tables that indicates the state of the record, deleted, updated, or whatever, whatever makes sense to you. For If we stop to considering deletions, it's just deleted true false. It means that all of the queries in and the entire application must take care of that additional column. And sometimes, especially when you use Entity Framework, eh, when you use Entity Framework, and especially the automatic uh, uh, filtering uh, on relationships, uh, this is a bit of an issue. Thanks God, this issue has been kind of fixed in Entity Framework Core. I had not much experience with Hibernate or in Hibernate to, 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 to mention uh, how the situation is in, 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 that, in that camp. So using soft deletions is uh, problematic because it may have an impact which is not devastating, but it's uh, widespread on the entire code base, at least uh, of the infrastructure layer. Soft update is uh, entirely up to you. And the simplest and, and most effective way, also the least intrusive way I've found in years to implement that is uh, placing, having in, in first place repositories all the way through. Which, and the repositories are the classes, in, the only classes in which the database, the details of the database, the connection, the DB context, whatever it is, is known. So intervening there and turning every update or delete operation into a transaction in which in the body of the transaction something else is done to possibly log the operation somewhere else. Now the nice news, the good news is that starting with uh, SQL Server 2016, we have uh, limited to basic crude operations some native support in, uh, from the tool. Now, the screenshot here, which has been taken from uh, uh, SQL Server Management Studio, shows a table called Bookings, and uh, that table has uh, a command in uh, round brackets, system version. Right-clicking, you see the menu, and in particular, the first item, new system version table. So there is support for this uh, new flavor of tables, also called the temporal tables. 
And uh, what is the difference between uh, normal classic tables and uh, temporal tables? The bookings history uh, table you see inside of the subtree rooted in the bookings uh, table. That bookings history, that is a table, is an additional table that is uh, read only for uh, developers. It's uh, the, the right, the permission to write on that table is reserved to the tool, to the product. So there is no API for uh, uh, writing into, uh, into that table. And uh, that table contains the list of changes for every single record added, updated, or deleted in the specific table. So you have a, every table is expanded, is exploded in a two tables, and this happens free of charge in the sense that only, only, the only thing that you have to take care of is turning the table into a temporal table. So, uh, temporal tables. Uh, child history tables are automatically created. Facts. The content of these uh, history tables is uh, read-only for uh, development code, and those tables cannot be deleted programmatically or through user interface, which is the same. Historical data can be queried through ad hoc SQL commands. Essentially, it's the same select statement with additional clauses in the end. And similarly, to create, a, even programmatically, a temporal table, it's about calling the same familiar create table uh, command with some additional parameters. You can't drop a temporal table, but uh, you can do that the moment in which, oh, right, you can drop a temporal table as long as it's a temporal table. But if you switch off the temporal attribute, if you manage to remove the system version attribute, then it becomes uh, just a, a, a uh, they become just two classic tables that you can intervene on the way you like. Here is the code to create the T-SQL code uh, to create a temporal table. Uh, the part in white is the regular code that would create uh, an employee um, table. The part in yellow is what is specific for a temporal table. In particular, uh, we are talking about adding a couple of additional date time columns whose name is entirely up to you. In this example, the names of the two date time columns is a sys start time and a sys end time, and they must be marked with a generated always has row start, generated always has row end. And uh, those uh, sentences, those syntactical sentences, r indicate that uh, each row represents the time in which the row of data became current or changed the state. So basically, uh, I'm saying that sys start time indicates the time, the time as it is the timestamp in week that represents the, the, the time in which the row entered in the current state described by the record. So the, it's a table that is a copy of the regular one plus two columns. So the, the values uh, of the records entered into value at the timestamp indicated by sys start time, and that value ceased to be effective at the time indicated by sys end time. And then period for system time is just an, a message to the, to the system to say, okay, sys start time and sys end time must be uh, considered the pair of columns that will uh, identify the period of validity for that state of the record. Okay, uh, table created with uh, system versioning on, history table equals the name of the table, uh, are the instructions in which we, through which we turn on 
system versioning on the temporality uh, of the table, and the history table is the instruction through which we, we set the name we expect the temporal table to have. Date time columns cannot be null, but can be arbitrarily named. They must be marked as a generator always as a row and or start. The use of those tables is entirely reserved to the system. The history table cannot have a primary key and can also be created uh, programmatically. So you don't have much, you know, much uh, M much room, okay, much more, there's not, not much, much margin for you to interact with uh, the creation of the history table. Uh, default history tables are given a clustered index on a date time uh, columns. So those indicated by the word, the keyword, the period. A clustered index is a special type of index uh, that reorders the way in which records in the table are physically stored. And this makes a difference between clustered and non clustered. Uh, index. If you uh, intend any way to create, a, uh, to use an existing table as a history table, it is highly recommended uh, that you give any way a clustered index uh, uh, according to Microsoft uh, for uh, uh, query performance and compression. And here is the way in which you switch off the temporal attribute uh, from, uh, from a table, alter table, whatever, set system versioning off, easy and effective. And after you run this instruction, you only have left in your database two normal classic tables that you can uh, play and work uh, the way you like. So in summary, a history table is a copy of the main table plus a couple of date time two columns which indicate the validity period for the particular state of the record. Uh, assuming that those columns are called valid from and valid to or sys and time and sys uh, uh, start time, uh, the first indicates when the record got a given state, the other one indicates when the validity of that state ceased. Updates and deletes are database operations that cause the values in the columns to change. And the funny thing is that this happens regardless of the tool you use to make changes. So it could be a code operation, ADO.NET operation. It can be an entity framework operation. Uh, it can be manual editing in the, in, the, in the SQL Server Management Studio. Regardless of the mean you use to alter the value in the database, inside, underneath, the records in the history tables are automatically added. And here we go. Before we get into, uh, into a demo, a screenshot to get you prepared. Uh, this screenshot uh, shows uh, in, in the top uh, a T-SQL instruction that updates uh, uh, a record in the, the bookings table where ID equals two and set the hour column to 13. And then uh, the first uh, of the select screens shows the output of select star from bookings where ID equals two. And in the, the first select is the query we make on the primary table, the classic select star from where. And in fact, we got the, the record with uh, ID equals to two, has room name hour set to 13, length and, and whatever. Then the second is, uh, select from booking history where ID equals two, we see something different. We see that there are two records. Both have the ID column to two. So we are talking about two different states of the same record in the primary table. And we see that the first record, the one with the ID uh, with the number one, uh, tells us that the record with the, the booking with ID two was uh, originally set to have a uh, hour equals to nine, length equals to one, owner equals to Joe, and uh, this value was assigned the 27th of September 2017 at a given time. And uh, this uh, state was 
changed. So this stopped being the current value of the column uh, 10 minutes later. At the same time, uh, 10 minutes later, a new state get into validity. And uh, the difference is that the owner changed from Joe to Dino. And this state set at uh, uh, always on the 27th of September at uh, uh, 2214 uh, stayed into validity for uh, about a minute. That's it. Every time you update something, a new record is automatically added to the history table, and you can query those things. OK. Let me bring up some, uh, let me arrange some demo for you. Now, I wanna go, uh, I'm doing a couple of things. Uh, uh, I first bring up uh, SQL Server Management Studio so that we can uh, uh, directly play with, uh, with, um, uh, with the tables, but I will also uh, use an entity framework-based ASP.NET application to show the issues you may face if you try to apply these features through the filter of Entity Framework. And uh, I'm using Entity Framework uh, uh, Classic, but unfortunately is exactly the same also in Entity Framework Core. Okay, so uh, as first thing, let me create the database. So uh, if uh, I, meanwhile, where it is? Yeah. So if. So you see that I have here, uh, there is no uh, Merlo 16 database here yet. So the moment I bring up this sample application and push the button field DB, uh, it should be able to create, uh, uh, to create a table. It takes just a few seconds. Uh, I'm using here the classic uh, infrastructure of entity framework to uh, create uh, uh, and, and populate uh, a database uh, uh, programmatically at the start of the application. So this is now the content of the freshly created database. Uh, what I've done is just uh, creating a new DB context and then using a seed, an initializer, for the database to automatically uh, feed in some records. If I go now back to, uh, to SQL Server Management Studio and refresh this, uh, I have this new database created. And if I expand this and I go on the table, you see this, okay? There is a DBO bookings system version. And if I expand this further, I find this booking history, exactly as you may have seen a moment ago in, uh, in the slides. Uh, okay, if now I take this and uh, I try to show you the structure of this table, there is no design button here. Uh, you see that this is uh, the list of columns uh, in this table, ID, room name, day, hour, length, owner, motivation, co just copies of the columns in the primary table plus sys start time and sys end time. Now, uh, let me edit the primary table. Let's take, uh, I don't know, this one. And uh, let's, uh, so it's the booking with ID one. And let's change the length to two. I right, save. 
And uh, if now I, let's see, problematic to do this here. If I do this query, I've got this. So querying the history table shows me now this uh, record, and it says that this record was uh, first created in the system today at the 9.32, it's UTC time. Uh, and uh, the validity of the state that I just changed, uh, editing length from one to two, okay, this state stopped being the current one less than a minute ago. If I repeat this, and I say that, for example, the motivation for this change is just for fun, and I switch back here and refresh, I have now a second record. And notice the, the crossing of the sys and time on record n and sys start time on record n plus one. It's the same. Because it says that, okay, the new state entered into validity the moment in which the previous one ceased to be valid, And uh, the state in which motivation was null, length was two, ended the moment in which the current state entered into validity. And again, this is uh, valid whether I edit through Management Studio through the grid or through any valid AP, programmatic API. Now, the question becomes, great, wonderful, fantastic, uh, if you check out the documentation, you can see easily ways okay, in which uh, this uh, uh, details about the, the specific T-SQL for updating for, uh, for updating is the same actually, for, for querying and for creating tables. Uh, my challenge when I first found this out was, okay, how can I integrate this in Entity Framework? And that was a little bit of a pain somewhere in the proverbial back end. So let's uh, switch back to Visual Studio now. And uh, yeah, this is the application here I have. So let's open it up again. Okay, so let's uh, refresh this. So you see that the record number one with ID one has a length equals two. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm missing the motivation column in this view. But if I click, Oh, too many breakpoints, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I, I will get back to, to you later. You, you are for later, okay? Show me the user interface. Okay, uh, let's go with this. <laughs> so, um, This is the instruction that, in the sample ASP.NET application, is responsible for querying the details of the record with uh, ID 1. So what I want to do now is giving you the entire uh, view with the entire list of changes, the history of that particular record, since the moment in which it was created up to the current state. To do so, I need actually to query in an extended way, the history table. 
Uh, but I only want to use, uh, if possible, Entity Framework. So this is uh, the first, this is the classic way in which I would uh, do that. So now look at what happens if uh, I Uh, okay, so if I go here, if I go here, the way through entity framework, uh, through basic entity framework, uh, I need to have uh, a query that has this additional segment. And because entity framework doesn't support this natively, it's up to me to edit on the fly the SQL for the command. So uh, what I do here is uh, I create a SQL text, command text manually, uh, select start from bookings uh, for uh, where ID equals, and for system time between date and date. And uh, date and date formatted in that particular way uh, come from uh, the dates I want to set. Uh, then I define completely the, the SQL command, and then I run this query. Var booking from uh, uh, DB bookings SQL query SQL. So get me the booking that results from running that query. So basically, Quite simply, I just change on the fly the SQL command that Entity Framework generates for every Entity Framework level kind of command. Now, there is one more change I need to make to this application, which explains why there was the zero, no record was returned. Uh, it happens here. This is the problem. So let me put this. Uh, so this refers. Uh, to what? So I'm telling the system, get me all the changes to the record with ID2 that occurred since the beginning up to yesterday. So all the changes I made to the table today can't be selected. This, uh, this is because I want to show in this way that you can uh, easily run queries for a segment, for a section, for a slice of the events and see, for example, all the changes a given record uniquely identified in the primary table faced when uh, in a given interval of time. So all the withdrawals in the last month, all the changes uh, in the past year, you can do that. You are not forced anyway to query from start to beginning, which is a crucial point of event sourcing in general. So if I modify this uh, to be today, and I try again, Now, this says that I have three records, which makes sense. Okay? Uh, now, ready for a big surprise? <laughs> now, when the drum rolling. 
there? Yes. Uh, now, reasonably, we expect these three records to be the three different states of the same record. This is the first one we find, and it represents the current state. ID one, length two, motivation for fun. Okay, good. Let's say the second. Oh, wow. It's the same. And the third, guess what, is yet another copy of the same record. This is because Entity Framework has no idea <laughs> of uh, history tables. And uh, adding support for history tables, temporary, temporary tables, whatever, to Entity Framework requires a significant rewrite of Entity Framework from the grounds up, which is something that the team, and I prompted personally the team many times, said, no way. Okay, we, we know we should be able to do this at some point in future, but it's uh, just the last of the last item in our backlog. And when, they, when I started talking to them about this was well before the Entity Framework core was released, even in Entity Framework is exactly the same thing. Now, why things are, are, are happening this way? The number of total records three is absolutely right, correct, perfect. The problem is that Entity Framework and every ORM uses something called identity map. It's one of the fundamental patterns of ORM that says essentially keep an in memory for cache, okay, of records you already retrieved in the current session of the DB context. And every time, and, and, and records are identified by key, so every time you have to provide access to a record with the same ID, you don't go to the database, but you take it from your internal identity map. So guess what? We are asking Entity Framework to retrieve three times a record with the same ID. And because it knows nothing about temporal tables, it just retrieves three times the same record from its identity map, so we have three times the current snapshot of the record, period. Okay, so you cannot do that with the Entity Framework. So let's see how we can do this in uh, any other way, which is using ADO.NET, which is also good for Entity Framework Core, uh, for um, the .NET Core. This application is not .NET Core, but because uh, data sets are back in Core, you can use this code here uh, as is uh, in uh, Entity Framework. So now we have history. History is now has three records, but if we now look at this, uh, we find, uh, now notice that the weird uh, uh, wrap-up packaging uh, of the record is my responsibility because uh, it's something that happens in the code of uh, find history by ID. So uh, I have here the ID of the record, I have the update, the, the, in the updated column, I have the, in the updated property actually, I have the, uh, the time it was, uh, of the change, and then I have the booking, okay, the, as a separate object, the, 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 the state he had. So this is the, essentially this is the first version of the record. Uh, number one, this is uh, the second version of the record, and this is the last one, the current version of the record. So I have all of them. If I go farther, I have this. I can build up this user interface. So this is the history of my record ID one, my booking number one, uh, in red, but that's pure user interface. I have the current state of the record, and I can see that this record was, uh, uh, it was uh, had a first uh, state uh, in which for fun was not set, uh, uh, which was uh, determined at uh, 9.35, and uh, this was the state that built on top of the state which was originally set at 9.32. And I did nothing myself to, you know, to, to add to this. It was all entirely uh, responsibility of SQL Server. 
Now, to finish off, uh, let me give you a few more uh, insights of the code I used here. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to show you. Uh, this is uh, the way in which I've done the effective query against uh, um, the history table. Uh, select uh, form from bookings for, yeah, for system time between uh, time and time. This is uh, the extra element you need to add to your uh, SQL statements. Uh, then it's just about opening a connection, running a command, getting a reader, and then uh, going through the reader. And then going through the reader, you build up any, any sort of uh, modeling uh, you want to um, return back to the caller application. Uh, this is for reading. Again, updates and deletions take place in the usual way. You just update and delete records. So the, the, the differences in uh, SQL is for uh, reading, for querying the history table, which is about this, and is how to create programmatically a table that is system version. And uh, this is something we find uh, this place. It's the booking database initializer. So uh, this is a this is a classic code uh, entity framework, uh, non-core, uh, through which you force the creation of a custom database if it doesn't exist, and then the initializer through the method seed. Okay, adds possibly a few records, but in this particular case, uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I first check if the version of SQL Server is uh, high enough to support this capability, and version number 13 indicates SQL Server 2016. I have, I think, 2017 on my machine now. Then, when this uh, method runs, the DB exists. It's guaranteed to exist. So all I do is alter table, add sys time, sys start time, generator has row start, sys end time, generated always has row end, alter table, system versioning on, history table, whatever, the default name. So I just alter it. The table has entity framework created it. It's just sort of an override that is completely transparent to the, to the rest of the application. So this means that if today, if you want to use in the context of entity framework or entity framework core based applications, if you want to use these tables, you can do that. You can manage in this way the creation of uh, temporal tables and, and uh, you can uh, go through ADO.net at least for the queries uh, that relate to history. You can use Entity Framework for any regular query, but if you need to query specifically the history table to produce UIs, like, you know, this is the history of the record, you have to go via ADO.net in that case. And there are no chances that this will change somehow, somewhere, somehow uh, soon in the future. Okay, uh, this is pretty much uh, done. Now, I want to close the presentation showing you another piece of code that is uh, specifically related to event sourcing. The problem we have with uh, the SQL-based solution is that we are limited to deal with the tables as they are in SQL Server. So if we need instead to track events that are not simply crude events, 
So created, deleted, updated, whatever. But we need to have events which are more business oriented, invoice created, invoice deleted. We need to replicate on this time entirely on our own a similar infrastructure. And I want to give you a quick example of how we can do that. Um, so imagine I have this, uh, imagine we are in the context of an ASP.NET application uh, that uh, represents, uh, implements uh, the scoring system for a sport match. So imagine that the user of this software is, uh, I don't know, the uh, uh, referee assistant that pushes button to keep track of things that happen as they happen in a sport match. So I have this a match controller, uh, which at some point receives uh, an input of type action, like goal scored, for example, or timeout uh, requested. And uh, this describes what has happened. I pass this information down to an application service, process action, and here we go, what happens here? There's a switch statement in which for, you know, for every event, for example, uh, the match, uh, the, a goal was scored. Now, let's take this one, okay? Uh, I have this event source manager, which is just my repository interface to an event source database. Well, to an event source storage, okay? And I say, okay, log the event and I pass all the information I have for the event the ID of the match, what has happened, and then additional information. Let's uh, take a look at uh, this log method. The log method does exactly this. It creates a new event. Uh, it creates a new event means it creates whatever it has to physically store in the real database. In this case, I'm not using Mongo, I'm not using uh, Cosmos, I'm not using anything NoSQL, I'm just using plain SQL. So I need to create a record from the event database where I'm, I expected to save my record. Uh, if uh, I knew that I could use uh, Mongo or Cosmos and use JSON serialization, uh, then you know, I have only, uh, instead of creating uh, 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 event builder new, I will just create you know, the, 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 the type, the object, okay, to serialize as JSON to my database. So I get this match event object, which is what I want to save, and then I pass this to event repository store, and I save this. I save the event, okay? Uh, an event database, whether you implement via Mongo, via Cosmos, via SQL, is an append-only store. So I appended a new event. Now, remember the story about the balance of your bank account? At this point, we have simply recorded a new operation on your bank account. We draw all deposit or whatever. Now, we need to update for the sake of the application, the balance, the, what is perceived as the state of the application. And uh, there are the following instructions. So I have to, I have a, the, the database of events, which are the source of truth, and then I have a parallel table which contains only one record for the same match with a current score. So one lists all the events, and another one with one single record for the same match shows me what is the current state that I can use, for example, for live scoring purposes. So I need to update the view table, the read model. And to do that, I create a fresh new instance of the match class, and then I, in this replay, I query for all events, I create a brand new instance of the match, and then I make a for each on all the events, and then every event turns to be an action that alters the state of the fresh instance of the match class. At the end of the loop, I have an instance of the match class whose state results from the replay of all events that in the history of the application referred 
to that particular instance. So at the end of the replay match, I have a, a new object that I just serialize to another table in which this time I just override a record. The new state is this. Of course, the two, the two phases, even st uh, repository.store and uh, uh, denormalizer.save, those two phases, in this case, are synchronized, are taking place one after the next, but they could be split. They could be one in the common stack and one in the read stack with some bus, some uh, form of uh, asynchronous uh, uh, connectivity that allows for better scalability or uh, whatever else you, you, you may think about. So this is uh, uh, another way. This is, the, this is the foundation of event sourcing, in which the, the fundamental point is that you use events the list of events as the source, the sole unique source of truth. Meaning that if you can draw, if you drop the read model table that you use for the user interface purposes, you can rebuild at any time that table just replaying all the million different events. Now, performance. Uh, in this stupid demo, I'm replaying all the events. But when events are thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. You use a concept called the snapshot. So you capture the state of the system at a given point in time. And then instead of starting from the beginning of the list of events, you start from the latest, the latest snapshot. And then you replay a smaller number of events. But anyway, uh, experiments done in the real world. And there is a product called Event Store from Greg Young that uses this approach. And it's the, the only that I know commercial product that does that. In that case, uh, yeah, in the end, you figure out, you easily figure out that you are always and regularly processing tens of records, tens of events per element, per entity. So it's absolutely doable. Okay, uh, I will make available all this uh, as a download, the slides and code, if you want. And uh, that's uh, pretty much everything. Uh, so, quoting even Martin Fowler, even sourcing captures all changes to an application state as a sequence of events. That's it, period. And a quote from Greg Young, uh, the guy who is doing uh, the most relevant work in the area of event sourcing, state transitions are an important part of our problem space and should be modeled within our domain. Uh, what I presented briefly is uh, not exactly modeling events in the domain, but the workshop of two days ago <laughs> had <laughs> a little bit more details on how to stuff events into um, domain model entities and not uh, entity database entity uh, entities. So, Pure crude, everything is pretty much done free of charge in SQL Server. <sighs> Events in uh, custom domains uh, is pretty much on us. Thank you very much for your time.